So it's an opportunity for everyone to engage with participants in an interactive, collaborative, case-based learning experience to expand your knowledge, skills, and ability to provide better care around bone health for breast and prostate cancer patients in your community. And we're glad to have Ashley Pariser with us today to give the didactic session. She is uh, soon to be at Ohio State um, University, which is at, sorry, the Ohio State University um, <laughs> down in Columbus. So on the next slide are the announcements. Um, just remind, reminding everyone to mute. Um, if you want to unmute yourself, you have to press star six. Um, and please read the rest of the announcements, announcements there. Um, if you want to talk during the discussions, please you can um, raise your hand or put something in the chat and we'll be watching the chat. Uh, please try to be on the video if possible um, so that we can see everybody. And this is being recorded and the slides are available um, after the fact if you want to look at them as well. And the next slide is just the agenda. So. Um, we're going to have the, the sort of case and didactic presentation all mixed into one, and then we'll have a discussion at the end and then some closing announcements. So I will turn it over to Dr. Pariser. Thank you so much. Can everybody see my slides? Yes. I see some nice head nods. Thank you. Um, so my name is Ashley Pariser. I'm very happy to be giving the topic today and just want to say thank you for the opportunity to present today. I am going to be talking about bone health issues in breast cancer. And the objectives that I'm hopeful to go through with you today is to review the risk factors, treatment options, and disparities in screening for rheumatase inhibitor associated bone loss summarize the recommendations for bone modifying agents in metastatic breast cancer, and discuss screening and management of bone health for breast cancer survivors. So basically, I organize this to talk about localized disease, metastatic, and then survivors. Before getting into the topic itself, I have four questions to prime everybody for the discussion, and then we will go through the answers at the end. Uh, so the first question, which of the following agents has the highest level of evidence for preventing aromatase inhibitor associated bone loss? And the options are zoledronic acid, alondronate, zondronate, abandronate, or denosumab. The second question is several current guidelines recommend baseline DEXA screening for women with breast cancer prior to initiation of adjuvant aromatase inhibitor therapy. What percentage of eligible women are currently undergoing baseline DEXA screening? The third question is which of the following is not recommended by ASCO Cancer Care Ontario guidelines for bone modifying agents in metastatic breast cancer? And then the four options there, all patients with breast cancer and bone metastases should be treated with a bone modifying agent. Patients initiated on bone modifying agents should be continued indefinitely. The nosumab 120 milligrams administered every 12 weeks is not inferior to every four week dosing. And lastly, higher rates of osteonecrosis of the jaw have been demonstrated with Q4 weak zoledronic acid. And then the last question uh, is all of the following breast cancer survivors should be offered a bone modifying agent except a 66 year old active female with a history of no negative hormone positive breast cancer completed five years of an AI in 2011 with a T4 of negative 2.0. Or a 45 year old active female with a history of no positive hormone positive breast cancer currently completing her fifth year of combined AI and ovarian suppression therapy with a T4 of negative 2.0 or a 75 year old sedentary female with a history of no negative, triple negative breast cancer with a T score of negative 2.5, or the last one, a 69 year old sedentary female with a history of no positive, hormone positive breast cancer, completed AI therapy last year, T score of negative 2.0 and history of RA. And I have a case that I saw in clinic that I was hopeful could help um, guide us through not only the discussion, um, but also come back to at the end 
of the presentation today to discuss all of the various things that we're talking about today. Um, this patient is AJ. She is a 51-year-old postmenopausal female who was initially diagnosed with a node-positive, hormone-positive right breast cancer in 2008. She got appropriate therapy with surgery, radiation, and was taking an aromatase inhibitor as well as a CDK4-6 inhibitor on a clinical trial when she was unfortunately diagnosed with a breast cancer on the opposite side, this time a node-negative, hormone-positive breast cancer. And this was less than a year after her initial um, right-sided breast cancer. She has now completed a bilateral mastectomy. She completed chemotherapy, and she has been placed on full vestrin um, for her hormone therapy. She is coming in today as part of her routine follow-up, but she really wants to discuss how to protect her bones because she got a repeat DEXA scan, um, and her T4 came back at a negative 2.0. And so hopefully everything we discussed today, we can have a nice discussion at the end of how to manage this wonderful woman. Any questions before I go into localized disease? So with localized disease, um, most of the literature really focuses on hormone positive postmenopausal women. And what comes up over and over again as a big issue in breast cancer is aromatase inhibitor associated bone loss, um, often seen in the literature as AIBL. And so just some background that we also talked about during the first session, aromatase inhibitors are associated with bone loss. It's usually two to four fold increase compared to just physiologic postmenopausal bone loss. This does lead to an increased risk of fracture. And if you look at the randomized clinical trials, most of them looking just at five years of aromatase inhibitor uh, use, that's about a 10%. And then the real world fracture risk is estimated to be higher than that. So this mainly comes from case studies as well as outcome studies looking at Sears, uh, Medicare data, single institution, and also one randomized clinical trial. Um, and so that is actually estimated to be a, about two times higher at 18 to 20% for the real world risk factor. Um, and then also keep in mind guidelines and in specific populations, you're actually talking about uh, seven to 10 years of therapy instead of five years of therapy. And so the risk of fracture does go up with the longer somebody is on an aromatase inhibitor. Um, additionally, things to consider, particularly for our breast cancer patients. So our FRAC score is very helpful, but it hasn't been validated in breast cancer patients. And so we can oftentimes underestimate the risk of aromatase inhibitor-induced bone loss. And it appears, looking at guidelines and literature, that the risk of fracture is actually similar to patients who have rheumatoid arthritis. And then similar to other patients who are not breast cancer patients, there are validated risk factors listed here that increase the risk of bone loss in these patients. I do want to go through the trials that have actually looked into bone modifying agents and how useful they are at preventing uh, bone loss and osteoporosis. And so this is a very small table, so I'm going to break it down by agent in the next couple of slides. So to start with the prevention trial, the highest level of evidence is for denosumab. And so the ABCSG18 trial, which I did mention uh, back in the first session, is the only trial that actually used fracture risk as an endpoint. Most of the other ones looked at DEXA screening as a surrogate marker. And so this is part of the reason that denosumab has the highest level of evidence. In this particular trial, they did denosumab versus placebo, and this was in postmenopausal women who were receiving adjuvant rheumatase inhibitor therapy. And it did show a significant reduction in vertebral fractures, and this was irrespective of the age or the baseline uh, bone mineral density of the patients enrolled in this trial. In terms of other agents, um, for zoledronic acid or IV um, bisphosphonate, there are four trials that really look at this. Three of them are part of the um, Samara zoledronic acid synergy trials, and so that's the fast, so fast. And so there's three of those trials as well as an alliance trial. And all of them looked at zoledronic acid, four milligrams every six months, and looked at either having women do immediate dosing 
at the start of the trial when they were starting their AI or delayed, and delayed being when they saw a drop in their DEXA uh, screening. And all four of the trials are very similar in that the immediate, the group that got the immediate zoledronic acid had superior um, uh, prevention of bone loss. And again, this was all based on bone mineral, mineral density and the DEXA screening. And none of these studies were actually powered to evaluate fracture incidence. And so this is a level two um, at level of evidence for IV zoledronic acid. And then lastly, the prevention trials also looked at oral bisphosphonates. And so the three, there are three that were um, evaluated. Um, and the level of evidence is two to three. For resondronate, the SABRE trial looked at um, resondronate 35 milligrams per week versus placebo, but both IBIS-2 and, and the RB study, they just looked at subgroups within those trials that had the resondronate added to their AI therapy, so there was no comparator. And it did show increases in bone mineral density, but they were small increases, and again, they didn't look at fracture risk. They weren't powered and didn't have enough patients to do so. Uh, similarly, with abandronate and alondronate, they did see improvements. Um, they looked at differences in patients that already had osteopenia or were at risk for osteoporosis and, and really looked at the differences between those subpopulations. So again, these are very small numbers of patients, but in general, very well tolerated, and they did see increases in the bone mineral density. Just the level of evidence is, is less than both IV zoledronic acid as well as denosumab. I put this slide up just to show that different, um, the guidelines are similar, but a little bit different depending on which expert group you look at. And so there's not one general across the board recommendation for which bone uh, modifying agent to use, when to use it, or for how long. Um, but in general, a lot of the criteria that they use are very similar. Um, and this is why there can be some confusion um, when you look at how osteoporosis, osteopenia, and screening is done in this um, particular group. So what this paper did is they tried to look at specifically for women who were at risk for aromatase inhibitor-associated bone loss, what would they recommend for their algorithm? And this is very similar to the algorithms that I showed way back in the first session, is in general, we're, look, we're looking at women who have T-scores that are less than either 1.5 with more than two risk factors or 1.2 or negative 2.0 and currently undergoing um, active treatment um, with either an AI or for premenopausal women, um, ovarian suppression, um, in addition to tamoxifen or an AI. Um, and in both groups, exercise and calcium D, but really in these two groups over on the left, consideration or offering of a bone modifying agent. The next part I wanna go into is the, there's still disparities when we talk about screening for osteoporosis and osteopenia. We know that a significant number of our breast cancer patients, particularly those with hormone-positive disease who are going to be getting aromatase inhibitors, are at risk, particularly our postmenopausal women, of developing osteopenia or osteoporosis and increasing their risk of fracture. But despite this, only about 50% of the women who are eligible are actually receiving their baseline DEXA scans. And this is based, this particular paper that I quote here is looking at the SPHERE Medicare data, but there's other papers looking at different um, retrospective, um, either insurance data or institutional data that has very similar um, rates of baseline DEXA screening. And then looking at follow-up DEXA scans, there's also a significant portion of women who are not receiving that as recommended. And when you look at what the risk factors are for people not receiving that, it tends to be our older patients, our non-white patients, and then for this study, uh, patients who had both Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries instead of just Medicare only. I'm going to quickly pause there to see if there's any questions before transitioning to metastatic disease. So I wanted to bring up, oh, please go ahead. Sorry, this is Lynn Henry. I just wanted to ask on the slide before, 
what is the definition of baseline? I mean, were they doing it within a certain time of starting AI therapy? Because a lot of times within they won't cover it if it's been more than two years. I mean, been less within than two years. years. It was within a year for this particular study, if I'm remembering correctly. And is that what you but, do? You make sure they've had it within a year? So for usually within two years, um, but again, it, also looking at what risk factors they have. Um, but I find um, some of my patients haven't even heard of a dental plan when they come to see me. Um, but there's definitely other patients um, where if it's within two years and they don't have a significant risk factor that would have increased their risk, I usually accept the two years. Thank you. Any other questions before I go to metastatic disease? So I wanted to briefly touch on metastatic disease um, because on the first presentation when I was talking about, you know, treatment recommendations and standards of care, I really focused on localized disease because that's the vast majority of breast cancer patients as well as the vast majority of data. Um, but unfortunately, bone metastases um, are quite common in breast cancer and a common site uh, for breast cancer uh, to go to. And so I did briefly want to go through what are the recommendations for bone modifying agents in this population? Um, so this is from the ASCO Cancer Care Ontario Guidelines. It came out in 2011 and then was revised in 2017. And it really recommends that all women uh, breast cancer patients with evidence of bone metastases uh, be offered a bone modifying agent. And there are three that have data to support it. And so that's pomidronate, zoledronic acid, and denosumab, and this table right here goes through the doses and the schedules. Um, one of the reasons that they updated the recommendations in 2017 is there had been three phase three trials that came out between the 2011 and 2017 guidelines that looked into zoledronic acid and showed that 12-week dosing was non-inferior to four-week dosing um, in terms of the their endpoints um, as well as they saw slightly higher uh, rates of osteonecrosis of the jaw with four-week dosing. Again, the numbers are really small. There are only two cases, um, but this is part of the updated recommendations in 2017. Of note, there are studies that are trying to do the same thing with denosumab, so trying to see if 12-week dosing is not inferior to four-week dosing. Those just have not resulted out yet, and so there was insufficient evidence um, to recommend this in the last uh, guidelines, uh, the most recent ones that we have there. Um, the last thing that I wanted to bring to everyone's attention is with bone modifying agents and metastatic disease, right now indefinite use is recommended, but something uh, that all providers should be aware of is many of our breast cancer patients, particularly those with hormone positive disease, may have much longer anticipated survival than the trials themselves were. So the trials were a couple of years, the follow-up was only a couple of years. And so if you have women with you know, oligometastatic disease or they just have one small metastasis, they may have very good long-term uh, survival. Um, you know, we're talking many, many years, but we just don't have the data to say what is the optimal dosing and how long. Um, is it two years? Is it three years? They just don't know. And so for right now, when you look at the guidelines, it says indefinite use, but obviously you have to do this on a case-to-case -case basis and weigh the risks and the benefits of the potential risks from the bone modifying agents as opposed to the benefits. And then uh, bone modifying agents do have a modest effect on pain, but obviously are not sufficient on their own to control pain from uh, bone metastases in most patients. Does anyone have any questions about the recommendations for metastatic disease? So the last um, part of the presentation for today is just a focus on breast cancer survivors. Um, thankfully, in the world of oncology, we're doing a much better job in terms of screening as well as treatments, and so we have a significant um, rising proportion of our patients who we would consider to be survivors. 
in breast cancer, this is particularly important because one in eight U.S. women are expected to be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. And many of these will be localized. Many of these patients will be survivors and be survivors for a very long time. And as of January of this year, there were over 3.5 million breast cancer survivors in the U.S. So obviously, this is a, a substantial patient population and one that particularly given the risk or osteopenia, osteoporosis, and possibly uh, fractures uh, needs to be thought of when we're talking about bone health. And so we already spent the majority talk of our time talking about the risk of aromatase inhibitors, but not forgetting about the risk of other treatments that they could have received, whether that's uh, chemotherapy. So the, over here, when we think of our chemotherapy-induced ovarian failure, and early menopause. Um, if they particularly have high-risk disease and premenopausal, they may have gotten ovarian suppression. And so again, there's these other risks that can really increase the risk of changes in the bone mineral density and increased risk for osteopenia, osteoporosis, and fractures. Similarly to the guidelines for our um, breast cancer patients when it comes to screening and treatment with bone modifying agents. Uh, there is a little bit of differences between ASCO, NCCN, and some of the European um, groups with regard to how often to screen patients and when to consider uh, starting bone modifying agents in these uh, patients. However, most of the recommendations are fairly similar. Um, when we look at recommendations pretty much across the board, really wanting to make sure that our patients are getting regular weight-bearing exercise and physical activity, making sure that they have adequate calcium and vitamin D. And then when we're thinking about when to start bone-modifying agents, very similarly to our other patients, uh, we're talking about well, what's their T-score risk, what's their FRAX, 10-year um, probability for hip fracture or major osteoporotic fracture, and then for lower T-scores, we're thinking about, well, are they still on therapy? Are they on adjuvant AI or adjuvant AI during suppression? Or do they have other risk factors that we really need to take into account so that they could really benefit um, from earlier intervention for the bones? Um, the majority of trials in this population, and some of these we've talked about, uh, ZFAST, ZOFAST. Uh, we also talked about ABC, SG12 in the first um, session, but most of them really focused on IV bisphosphonates. Um, one, when we look at the guidelines or recommendations that have been published, it's really based on the individual survivor. So for some patients, it might be the oral um, bisphosphonates that are the best option, or for another, it might be denosumab. We really don't um, tend to use uh, teriparatide um, in cancer populations. There were animal studies that showed an increased risk of osteosarcoma that hasn't really uh, borne out uh, so far in human studies. And there's a theoretical risk in certain cancers that this might actually stimulate growth of those cells. The reason I put it on this slide is there was actually a, a paper that uh, just been published showing that this might be helpful for treatment of osteonecrosis of the jaw. So I'm interested to see how this might benefit this population or if we might start seeing more use in breast cancer survivors, particularly those who unfortunately develop osteonecrosis of the jaw. So in summary, all women with hormone positive breast cancer taking adjuvant AI therapy should be screened um, for rheumatase induced bone loss. There is data to support oral IV as well as denosumab, um, with denosumab having the highest level of evidence. Um, all patients with metastatic breast cancer and bone metastasis should be offered um, bone modifying agents. Exactly how long to use them is the optimal length. We really have limited data on that. So right now it's saying indefinite use, but obviously you should take into account the individual factors of your patient. And then for our breast cancer survivors, they have many risk factors. And so making sure that they're actually receiving the screening and treatment um, that is recommended for them. So with that, I do want to go back to the questions at the beginning um, and see um, if we 
if people had the right answers to start with or uh, learn something today. So for question one, uh, which of the following agents has the highest level of evidence for preventing aromatase inhibitor associated bone loss? Um, and the answer for <laughs> the answer for this is uh, denosumab, and it's really because there's really the only agent right now that we have um, evidence for reduced fracture risk, whereas the other ones we see improvements in the bone mineral densities, um, but they were not powered. They just didn't have the number of patients to be powered to look at fracture risk um, for the other agents. Uh, for question number two, several current guidelines recommend baseline DEXA screening for women with breast cancer prior to initiation of adjuvant aromatase inhibitor therapy. What percentage of eligible women are currently undergoing baseline DEXA screening? So it's 50%. Yes, so 50% is really what most of the, the studies um, looking retrospectively have shown. And also if others are speaking, a lot of you are on mute just so that you are aware of that. For question three, uh, which of the following is not recommended by the ASCO Cancer Care Ontario guidelines for bone modifying agents in metastatic breast cancer? The first option is all patients with breast cancer and bone metastasis should be treated with a bone modifying agent. The second is patients initiated on bone modifying agents should be continued indefinitely. The third is denosumab 120 administered every 12 weeks is not inferior to every four week dosing. And then lastly, higher rates of osteonecrosis of the jaw have been demonstrated in Q4 week doldronic acid dosing. So I'm the only one that's not on mute, it seems, of denosumab number three. <laughs> yeah. So right now we have good phase three data for zoledronic acid for non-inferiority of 12 weeks to four weeks. Um, but the denosumab trials are currently ongoing and have not yet um, published their data. And then question four, all the following breast cancer survivors should be offered a, a BMA except really which is of these sort of, which would you offer last, I guess, or least appropriate? The first is 66-year-old active female with history of node-negative hormone-positive breast cancer who completed five years of AI in 2011 with a T-score of negative 2.0. The second is a 45-year-old active female with history of node-negative hormone-positive breast cancer currently completing her fifth year of combined aromatase inhibitor and ovarian suppression therapy and a T-score of negative 2.0. The third, a 75-year-old sedentary female with a history of no negative, triple negative breast cancer, a T-score of negative 2.5. And then lastly, a 69-year-old sedentary female with a history of no positive, hormone positive breast cancer, completed AI therapy last year, T-score of negative 2.0 and a history of RA. What do people think for this one? Well, I was looking at the 45-year-old the because he's at a lower risk for fracture. And I would think that she, James is in her fifth year compared to the 66-year-old who's in her fifth year. Um, oh, no, she completed five years, but she's older and her fracture risk is higher. So I would, I think it's tough, but I think maybe number two, I'm not sure. Um, so, I number the reason that I selected number one as opposed to number two. So the 45-year-old female um, is currently having active treatment. She has very um, high-risk disease with the node-positive, hormone-positive disease. She has not ovarian suppression, which, if you remember the cancer survivor chart, that increases the risk more than AI alone. 
a fracture. And it, this is remembering way back to the first session, but the um, ABCSG12, um, there, you have a reduction in the risk of recurrence of zoledronic acid in addition to improvement of the bone mineral density. And so it might um, reduce the risk of this coming back or having recurrence that's metastatic in the future. And so those were all the reasons why I chose number one instead of number two. Although doesn't um, that so assume that the 45 year old is going to continue on therapy and also that there's a benefit to adding zoledronic acid at year five as opposed to at the beginning? It does. And so you, I, you really could make an argument for all of these patients. Um, what I was hopeful for people to think through, so, so for the 66 year old, um, she completed therapy nine years ago. Um, she's active. Um, she doesn't have any other risk factors here. Um, again, you know, if I were to go back and make this uh, an easier question, if I say, you know, completing her first year of therapy, yes, that would make, um, you can make an argument for all of these. That was just sort of the, the thinking and the talking points that I was hopeful to go through. And then the third one, obviously, the T-score is uh, less than negative 2.5. She's osteoporosis. And then here, our 69-year-old has multiple risk factors in addition to a T-score of negative 2.0. So before going back to the case, I just wanted to pause and see if anybody had any questions on either any of the questions or any of the material that we've covered so far. And I'm not trying to discourage questions, but if you do have any questions or comments, please uh, explain uh, who you are, where you're from, introduce yourself uh, before talking. But I still want to encourage people to talk. So. Well, while everybody is thinking of things that they want to discuss, I was just going to read through the case again, um, because I think there's many things we can discuss here. Um, so AJ is a 51-year-old postmenopausal female. She was initially diagnosed with a right-sided breast cancer two years ago. It was no positive, hormone positive. She got surgery, she got radiation, and then she was placed on an adjuvant trial with an aromatase inhibitor as well as a CDK4-6 um, inhibitor. And then unfortunately, while she was on therapy, um, she developed a left-sided hormone positive, no negative breast cancer. She has had surgery of both breasts at this point. She also had chemotherapy and she was switched to full vestrin for her, her hormone therapy. And um, as part of her treatment, she was enrolled in a study that was looking at exercise. And as part of that, there was screening um, of her bone that was done um, in 2008 and then again in 2009. So she got a DEXA scan and there was a decrease in her T-score um, and it was a score of negative 2.0. And so she's an active, she's a rel very active 51 year old. And so she came into the office and really wanted to talk through kind of what are her options, what should she be doing to optimize her bone health. And so, really what I was hopeful to talk through and have a, a discussion on is how would you counsel her on her risk and what, if anything, would you recommend at this, this point and why? Does anyone have any thoughts? So it's a patient who was on AI plus CDK4-6, is now switching to Fulvestrin, um, has osteopenia, 51 years old, postmenopausal. So I, I guess I'll start off by saying, what is the, um, what effect does Fulvestrin have on bones? I know most of what we talked about was aromatase inhibitors, and it works very differently. There's definitely less um, less of the studies looking at um, AI, sorry, at Fulvestrin as opposed to the AI. Um, she, um, 
to be honest, I don't know the studies quite as well in terms of the, the numbers for, for fractures um, for full vestra. So I would probably just then, I would, in the absence of evidence, I would treat her like a person, a, a woman on AI. And uh, it looks like, you know, she would meet the criteria for us to consider giving her uh, denosumab because we have the most evidence for that. Um, and if that wasn't something she was, you know, if that, that wasn't uh, agreeable to her, if she wasn't amenable to that, and or her insurance wouldn't cover it and there was an expense issue, then IV zoledronic acid would be something. I mean, she definitely has a T-score that would get her there and uh, she is in active treatment. And we really, as you said, we don't know much about fulvestran. It's, it's, it's blocking the receptors and the bone has receptors for estrogen. So that's how I would approach it. So we definitely had a discussion about denosumab with her. We also talked about the ABC SG12 trial with her, you know, with the caveat of full vestrin isn't quite the same as an AI, um, but there is that small potential benefit to reduce the risk of recurrence to bone. Um, ultimately, she decided she wanted to do denosumab because the Q6 month dosing as opposed to the 12 week dosing was just more, was much better for her in terms of visits um, and coming in. Um, and she was already getting the shots for the full vestrin, so just kind of the shot burden. Um, but we did talk about both of those as potential options for her. Um, and, you know, the other thing is she was a very active exerciser. She actually had um, signed up to work with a personal trainer, so she was trying to increase her, her weightlifting that she was doing. Diet-wise, she actually was doing very well. Um, and part of our survivorship clinic, we have a really great nutritionist, so she had actually asked to speak with her just to make sure she was optimizing her nutrition um, from that standpoint as well. So she had really optimized everything else that she could be doing in terms of exercise and diet. Um, and then this was just kind of the next step for her as well. I wonder if um, there's a, um, if, I, if it, people have looked into the frequency of the dosing of the zoledronic acid, because I think what happens in real life is if patients are seen sort of outside of the cancer center and not by their breast oncologist and they're seen by their primary care or their rheumatologist or their endocrinologist that they may try for denosumab, um, but then there's going to be hurdles in terms of uh, getting that covered and, and so forth. And then if, if patients are prescribed IV zoledronic acid, typically that's going to be once a year. That's what they're going to be prescribed because they're not aware of this Q, you know, three month, or Q three month sort of dosing. Um, what do you think about that? Do you think that's true, that it actually is, that's what's happening in real life? That's what I see. I think if, again, it, it probably does depend on where they're getting the counseling. I think you're right from that standpoint. I think we, I see a, a more biased sample because I'm seeing patients who were treating um, with the bone modifying agents. And so, you know, we're either doing it every you know, four weeks or 12 weeks, you know, for metastatic disease or on, you know, more six month or three month dosing, depending on, you know, where, which of those categories they, they find, they, sorry, they fit into. Um, but again, when we think, especially for our cancer survivors, where they're not on active treatment and we're thinking more about their long-term osteoporosis risk, absolutely yearly dosing. And sometimes we do do that in our clinics as well. And so I get, I think it just depends on when you take the, their risk as a whole, where do they best fit in? Are they localized disease on active treatment? Are they metastatic disease with bone metastasis? Are they cancer survivors where they don't have significant other risks as opposed, and they finish their treatment a long time ago? Um, but I think in some of these areas, we don't have as good of data, you know, whether that's we just haven't looked at how long to treat people with metastatic disease. We have the trials that we have, and they did it for you know two years, and so they just say 
continue it as long as they're tolerating it. Um, whereas, you know, I think there probably are a lot of women who maybe would benefit from a year, but we just don't have the data in this particular population. Yeah, I, I think that's, a, that's an issue because the uh, um, non-oncologists don't necessarily follow or are aware of the, the cancer guidelines, ASCO, and, and, um, and a lot of times, sometimes you'll see the oncologist will refer to the endocrinologist or for, for treatment of osteoporosis or uh, aromatase inhibitor bone loss. And so when the endocrinologist or, you know, APPs see them, they're going to go to their go-to, which is really not ASCO. It's going to be, you know, the, the osteoporosis guidelines. And that tells them, and I can tell you, none of our APPs would ever do anything every three months unless, uh, and, and besides it actually is a very hard sell to get the patient to buy into even a once yearly. Um, they even turn up, you know, basically they, they'll, they'll argue about the prolia because, uh, you know, it's um, every six months and they can get away with once yearly. That's so, so, you know, you kind of have to deal with the, the issue that you have, but I, I see that there, that the studies were done on uh, every, every three months. And so it's kind of like what we have. Yeah. So. But I thought our institution, if we have a, if we have a postmenopausal woman on AI therapy who has a low risk, you know, stage one breast cancer, and we're really giving the, um, the bisphosphonate for treatment of osteoporosis and not to decrease her risk of breast cancer because her risk of breast cancer recurrence is so low to start with. We often give the one year zoledronic acid um, because the prolia is so expensive. Do you give that for aromatase inhibitor bone loss as well? Like, so for instance, she's not osteoporosis. She has negative two, she's this case, all right? Not, but she's not on the, 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 that drug. So negative. So osteopenia, yeah. Yeah, oh, osteopenia. So, yeah, osteopenia. And, and you would give that because of you're looking at aromatase inhibitor bone loss and the prevention of that throughout her therapy. And then, you know, there, we don't really discuss as much, uh, although on occasion I do, uh, about the decrease in the risk of um, uh, metastatic disease unless, you know, the patient is uh, at a high risk. In which case, then right. maybe, yeah, that's already been done. But that those are the people that maybe once a year is olandronic acid, you're not doing it for the, the bone metastases protection or, or the, the, the decreased risk of metastases. Uh, you're doing it more for the uh, osteopenia and aromatase yeah. inhibitor. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's a lot cheaper for the patient. Yeah. Other comments, questions from anybody about any of these different issues, metastatic disease, AI, or just general survivorship? So I guess one more thing, um, I, when I, we go to kind of make our own institutional uh, guidelines and to help our APPs, um, that is it fair to say that if we're doing this for aromatase inhibitor bone loss and not necessarily for decreasing the risk of recurrence, that the once yearly IV zoledronic acid is a reasonable thing to do and that when we, but when we go towards decreasing risk of recurrence that we should adhere to the denosumab Q six months or, oh wait, denosumab, when is that Q? So denosumab months, or yeah, the AI yeah. is Q, yeah. Q6 months. Um, yeah. When yeah. we talk about metastatic disease with people with bone, that's when we're talking about denosumab every four weeks or, or zoledronic acid every 12 weeks. But when we're talking about prevention of osteoporosis, that's when we're just talking about the longer, or like our cancer survivors, the Q yearly or, you know, the Q uh, six months for denosumab. And then what do you do about the potential for rebound when you stop the denosumab? So I definitely, in my more limited experience, um, I've just generally been using much more zoledronic acid for all of the reasons that you have stated. It's cheaper, um, especially for a low risk patient. You can give it less frequently. Um, Denosumab, um, I, 
I have just used a lot less frequently, so I've seen a lot less of the rebound effect compared yeah. to the zoledronic acid in my experience. Um, but I know we have wonderful endocrinologists on the line. How have uh, how have all of you been dealing with the rebound from the from the denosumab? Uh, so we basically have a, a, a rule that we invoke with the patient when we start them on the denosumab that you're never going to go off the denosumab without starting uh, a, uh, either a IV bisphosphonate or a, a uh, oral bisphosphonate because you'll have a tremendous decrease and you'll lose all of your, um, your gains that you had from bone mineral density and your fracture risk increases. So we try to avoid that, you know, in all circumstances. Yeah, there are some patients, yeah, I mean, some patients will say, uh, I want to do, I, I would like to take prolia, but not, I don't want to take uh, any kind of um, bisphosphonate. And I always make it clear that all roads end to on bisphosphonate if you're going to be treated with denosumab for any period of time. Otherwise, you know, it, it is uh, it, it's really not a benefit. You're just going to be losing everything and then that fracture risk increases uh, what you have to look at. And how long do you continue to bisphosphonate for then until you stop completely? Yeah, so, so that's the other thing um, is um, we would continue the bisphosphonate and then you get into the idea of are we going to give them any kind of drug holidays, you know, in between. And then, you know, we would possibly do, you know, something where you would maybe extend it to 18 months or you would go two years. And this is where there's no evidence at all, you know, uh -huh. just like what they've told us to have a pause. So if you're really concerned about the, the risk of, uh, uh, atypical femoral fracture or osteonecrosis of jaw and you want to give a holiday, then that's what you're doing. And yes, you may have a rebound, but I don't know that it would be as severe or as acute as it would be if you just went off of the denosumab. Yeah. Any other comments from anyone? Or any uh, last thoughts from Dr. Pariser? No, nope. thank you all for a wonderful discussion. That was really helpful, Ashley. Thank you so much. It just as a reminder about the uh, closing announcements. <laughs> um, there will be a survey as usual, so please, um, we encourage everyone to complete that. And um, you know, as, as was mentioned at the very beginning, you know, if you have other people at your site who are interested in learning this information, you obviously could share the information that you learn, but also they can participate in the call. Um, start thinking about the coordination and implementation QI project. Um, and Nicole can fill people in more about those details. Um, we have been considering whether or not to move this up to earlier on a Friday, potentially, or to a different time. Um, in part because when there are two speakers, an hour really isn't long enough, and also to try to encourage increased attendance. So if you have preferences, please speak up. Um, and then please, please send in your um, case presentation, because we like to make this as real life as possible. And the next one will be Friday, August 28th, which is not right before Labor Day weekend, it's the week before that. Um, currently scheduled from 4 to 5 p.m. And that'll be the same sort of talk, but specifically focused on prostate cancer. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Nicole, did you have final things to say? No, just reminding all the faculty, both national and spoke site faculty, to send your headshot to the ACS website. They plan on launching that soon, and it's highlighting all the echo work of the American Cancer Society. We want to highlight your beautiful faces. And thank you for joining the call today. Thank you, Nicole, for bringing this together. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Velosky. All right. Thanks, good everyone. everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.
Dr. McKay, are you still there? Can you hear me? 